Give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money. I shit on the lore nerds a lot on this show, and for good reason. They actively make properties worse through their warped priorities. But this idea gets some pushback from people who are convinced that lore is the most important thing in any cartoon, from Friendship is Mandatory to Steven Ubermensch to Little Witch Macadamia Nut. Lore is the most important thing, they cry. Why though? I've asked this question a few times, and nobody has ever really had an answer. Rather, they tend to just waffle around it a lot by claiming it's important over and over again until you just give up. But let's back up. Many of you who aren't that big into this crap have asked me in the past, what is lore and why is it so inconsequential? Lore is the supplementary material of a setting. You set a story in a world and lore is what you sprinkle around a world to make it feel alive. Things like history of the world, cultural trends, society, social norms, and mythology are all parts of the lore. In Revenge of the Sith, for example, one of the ways in which Palpatine sways Anakin to the dark side is by preying on his fears of losing Padme and telling him the story of Darth Plagueis, a Sith so powerful he could keep people from dying. That story about Darth Plagueis is a piece of lore because it's an in-universe myth. Lore is very different from a story. Lore is what has or might have happened, and the story is what is happening. To give a more politically cynical example, lore is the fascist takeover of Europe in the 1940s, story is the fascist takeover of North America happening right now. In any piece of narrative fiction, regardless of the medium it appears in, the story is the most important thing, more important than anything else. If your story sucks, your entire work sucks, and nothing, not the lore, not the animation, not the music, not the voice acting, none of that will salvage a bad story. Lore is important in the same way that cinnamon is important. It can add a great deal of flavor, but only in small doses. Lore is best written on a need-to-know basis. If we don't go to a certain place as part of a story, we don't need to know that it exists. Stories that center entirely on lore or place lore in a position above the story is like the cinnamon challenge. Painful, dangerous, and nobody's happy by the end of it. People who obsess over lore are the people who think the brief internet fame from doing the cinnamon challenge is worth anything. There's been a recent explosion of people absolutely obsessed with lore in modern cartoons. Part of it has to do with the push towards serialization, leading to an increased focus on world building, but it's been around since comic books started getting really into continuity, and one could argue that's where it started. Superhero comics started pushing big, multi-layered continuity as a method of getting readers addicted and convincing them to continue wasting their money on comic books and figurines instead of more responsible financial investments, because they were all connected somehow. It was also a really good way to force people to buy side stories and spin-offs. DC Comics went so overboard with this lunacy that they developed an entire multiverse with tons of alternate universes of characters and then collapsed them into one singular universe after it became too much to juggle. That was deliberate on the part of the creators, though. They wanted people to get addicted to ensure a guaranteed source of revenue. What about when it's not intended and the fans do it to themselves? The biggest example of this I can pull from memory is The Legend of Zelda, a series of adventure games released from the NES era all the way to today. Until very recently, the Zelda series was always self-contained stories with no actual continuity between them. Same characters, but new designs, worlds, aesthetics, what have you. Because it's written with a Nintendo mindset, the story is extremely bare bones. Rescue the princess, collect the items, explore dungeons, fight a pig. The only reason any of this even exists is as a thin veneer of an excuse for the gameplay to happen. The Zelda series is all about dungeon crawling, exploration, and adventuring. That's why the art style is the thing that shifts so often from game to game, to give you new vistas to explore and try out new gameplay mechanics. The story was only ever an excuse to go from dungeon to dungeon and wasn't even given much focus until Ocarina of Time. This was the appeal of Zelda, adventuring, exploring dungeons, finding secrets and treasures, battling monsters. You know, Nintendo could easily release a basic Zelda game and just add a new dungeon to it every month as DLC, and they'd have one of the most popular games in the series. However, the fanbase quickly became obsessed with the continuity and the dreaded timeline, something that never actually existed in the series to the point that Nintendo would repeatedly deny it. Except for the direct sequels, every game was its own separate element, and a strong argument could be made that this was what Nintendo should have stuck with. Either way, though, Nintendo released Hyrule Historia, and canonized a very convoluted timeline for the games anyway, and almost immediately the big thing everyone talked about when a new Zelda game was released was, where does it fit in the timeline? The Zelda series got a big lore upgrade with gods and demons and long-standing prophecies and blah, blah, blah. Why was this a problem? 
Well, remember what I said about how lore is supposed to complement a story? Zelda games barely have any actual story, and when they put the focus on the story, it's fucking dreadful, and Nintendo can't actually write and still approaches writing from a pre-2000 philosophy. So Link is now this important Avatar-esque hero who we're told has this important character arc, except they don't because they're the same mute, androgynous, placid-faced, unemotive kid that they are in every single game. Ganon is now this looming threat to the point that they've started calling him Calamity Ganon, but he's still the same old cackling wizard with the same old boring plan who's doomed to regenerate endlessly like he's Vera Mathras. This created the one thing the Zelda series never needed, a status quo. This killed the core selling point of the series and so many people became so vocal about their insistence that things not change or deviate from the continuity that it alienated everything. Any potentially new or weird idea now had to pass through the filter of the canon, or should I say Calamity Canon. Oh, that was terrible. Let's reincarnate Link as a Goron. No, that goes against the timeline. Let's play as Zelda and have Link be the bad guy. No, that breaks the prophecy. Let's have Link be a girl this time? No, that fucks with the timeline because these glass windows said so. Stop laughing. Are you starting to see the problem? With no real story and no real characters, the lore and world building completely went to waste. There's a reason that the side quests are often the most memorable things. Because the main game isn't actually fun. Okay, that's all great, you might be thinking. Well, that's probably not what you're thinking. You're probably thinking this is all boring as piss. But how does this all tie into your thesis that lore nerds are completely missing the point, and how does this relate to cartoons and how lore is hurting them? Well, these are the reasons that continuity is so focused on, because there was little material to look at otherwise. In the absence of compelling stories that were about things, fans could do nothing but fill up wikis with as many plot details as they could. Unfortunately, it became the default mode for a lot of people, and they ended up growing up and starting their own YouTube channels, and that's how we're in this mess we're currently in. No modern show illustrates how damaged and destructive and overfocus on lore can be better than Friendship is Magic. Friendship is Magic is unique in that it started out as just an average Saturday morning cartoon and accidentally gathered an audience of adults, while most cartoons made after Friendship is Magic have been deliberately trying to court the hipster parent demographic. This is why other cartoons go to shit within a single season, while Friendship is Magic took seven years to get there. So when Friendship is Magic started, it was mostly a slice of life comedy about interpersonal relationships. It may have started off with a big grand adventure, but it quickly settled into a formula that worked very well. Self contained stories about interpersonal relationships with stakes that were high to individual characters but low in the grand scheme of things. The main focus of Friendship is Magic was its themes. One of its earliest episodes was about the importance of cutting abusive people out of your life. They were relatively tame for the most part. Sharing is important. Don't be a needless asshole. Let people have their weird delusions in peace. Don't be racist. Simple stuff. As the seasons went on, Friendship is Magic started to tackle subjects that were a little more complex, but ultimately still related to the main idea of interpersonal relationships. The main focus was ultimately on conflict resolution, how to deal with problems when they arise and solve them. Still, the very best episode of the series is about the importance of doing what's good for someone, even if it hurts and doesn't make you feel all warm and fuzzy about yourself. Ironically, there's a lot to unpack and examine about those lessons, and you could get a lot of material just talking about the themes if you really wanted to. There's just one problem. Doing that takes effort. The Brony fandom largely ignored the themes and interpersonal nature of the series to focus instead on the world, the history of the two sisters, the biology behind changelings, the history of Equestria pre-series, the inner workings of the surrounding kingdoms. Focus more on the world, the Bronies cried out for years. Move away from the main six click. You see, this is where we come to the little dirty secret about lore. Lore is easy, because you're just keeping a record of all the things that have happened in a wiki. There isn't much thought that goes into it other than brute force memorization. Analyzing the story and the themes, however? That's a lot more difficult. That requires a great deal of experience with the individual issues the show covers, and more than a fair amount of knowledge regarding topics that, in recent years, have become needlessly politicized. It takes more than the ability to memorize a list of names. It takes critical thinking, conflict resolution, and a fair amount of general wisdom. This is something that's in short supply among much of the Brony analysis community. That's why they ignore the lessons half the time. And when they do address them, they interpret them badly because their own values are completely backward and self-contradictory. So there's been a push from the Brony fandom to focus more on the world and other areas of Equestria, not because they think it would enrich in the story in any way, but because they want to fill in the unexplored areas of the map and fill more wiki pages. And in Season 5, they've started doing that, with Season 8 being the point where they went all in on the idea. The problem is that a show about interpersonal 
relationships doesn't work if you subtract the interpersonal relationships. Many of the values the show had about conflict resolution and healthy communication only worked in the relatively mundane and small-scale setting the series had. Taking those same values to a quasi-political platform proved to be a weakness at best and a downright failure at worst. The values of the show worked with interpersonal relationships because the conflicts of an interpersonal relationship were small. Arguments, fights, personal victimization, all of those things were ideally suited to social lessons aimed at kids. Around season 5, the conflicts grew bigger. Systemic racism, the threat of war, global diplomacy, and terrorism were now being expected to be solved with friendship lessons. And newsflash, they can't be. Much of Friendship is Magic's Forgiveness First themes barely worked when applied to schoolyard bullies, but now it was being expected to work when applied to violent terrorists and fascists. Where previously we had to stop two people fighting or it might ruin a town festival, now we have to stop two people fighting because it might start a war. This was bad enough, but it also came at a time where friendship stopped being a complicated and nuanced concept, but rather a vague and incomprehensible entity unto itself. Friendship in My Little Pony Circus Season 5 became treated like the light, a strange thing that you have to put your faith in rather than something you're constantly working on. Your old life has passed. The light will forge you a new one. It is not yours to take. The light will heal your scars. I am my scars. Friendships in general require time and constant effort, and this is why the show never really moved away from the main six for the longest time. Now new friends are constantly being made by the new characters and cast aside almost never to be seen again, simply because you can't fit that many characters into an ensemble cast and expect every relationship to be well written. As a result, it's becoming increasingly like Twilight is collecting friends for the sheer status of it and treating them with absolutely no regard. Case in point, Moondancer. Someone who had something of a breakdown because Twilight up and abandoned her without a second thought, after which she was again abandoned without a second thought. And this is how Twilight treats a lot of people as a result of this change in focus, gathering more friends for the sake of having a lot of friends because it's good for her ego. This isn't really a problem with Twilight's character, this is just what happens when the writers switch from writing stories about relationships to friendship preachings. Twilight starts to come off as manipulative at best and outright abusive at worst, and that's ultimately what they've done over the years. Because they started indulging the fandom in what it claimed it wanted for so long, it can't stay in one place and so can't keep characters around. So Twilight shows up, collects her new psychologically damaged redhead, and then leaves without a word. She spends a lot of time preaching about friendship, and very little time actually practicing it. This extends even to episodes that aren't about the world, which are growing shorter in number by the day. Friendship is Magic seems determined to have a new Do Princesses Dream of Magic Sheep every season now, as more and more serious issues like abuse and trauma are brought up, and the solution is to either just forgive it and mend fences, or ignore it and hope it goes away. We've now had three episodes, Newbie Dash, Parental Glidance, and The Parent Man, Map, whose themes have come down to get over it and make nice because friendship demands it. This is a stark contrast from You know, this is not how I thought my old friends would treat my new friends. If being cool is all you care about, maybe you should go find some new cool friends someplace else. Why exactly is the show doing this? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but I maintain that it's because it's easier. My last video about Starlight reached the ears of Nick Confalone, one of the writers at Friendship is Magic, who initially tried to sidestep the whole thing with a remark about how the amount of work that went into that video means that they have the best fandom in the world. I'd just like to take an aside and say, Nick, no you fucking don't. I'm not part of your fandom, nor will I ever be. The viewer who sent this to Confalone prodded him just a little bit, and Confalone did a 180, remarking about how it's cute that they think the work that went into a 12-minute video essay compares to the work that goes into a 22-minute script of a cartoon, essentially saying, I work harder, so fuck you. Methinks I might have plucked a nerve. Nobody even accused the writers of being lazy, they just insinuated that they were not paying attention to what they were doing. But that was enough to set Confalone off, apparently. This is the reason the show has become like this. It's easier and gets more cheers from the public to just slap together some world-building exercise that you're never going to touch again and call that an episode. Laziness really is the sole motivating factor because the writers know that they can do jack shit, and as long as it involves world-building in some way, the brony fandom will lap it up. Shadowplay got best episode of season 7 from a lot of people entirely because of the content continuity in the episode. That was all they paid attention to. It was all they cared about. And in that environment, with such an easily pleased and easily distracted audience, the temptation to just do fuck all work and go home early is too high for most people to resist. The fact of the matter is that the reason Friendship is Magic went hog wild with toxic lessons, world building that went to waste, and snapshot redemptions is because it's what the very vocal fan base wanted it to do and remains blind to the problems it creates. Silver Krill recently tried to pin the fact that Starlight remains a contentious character on Sixth Ranger Syndrome, where a new 
characters that the cast is stubbornly resisted at all times. Many easily distracted bronies continue to reassure themselves that Starlight is only hated by others because they're just being stubborn. But here's the thing. If that really was the case, and it really was just a stubborn resistance to additions to the main cast, Sunset wouldn't be loved by absolutely fucking everyone, including me. It's not stubbornness or some kind of unconscious reaction inherent to fandoms that makes Starlight contentious. She's just a shit fucking character that gets too much screen time where she continues being shit. People kept demanding that the show go this way and abandon all semblance of entertainment so that they would just have a big sandbox for their fan works and headcanons. Inkro spent years devoting her time to headcanons about the lore and history and tended to get really upset when the show didn't accept her crappy theories about Celestia being a seraphim or whatever. Silverquill constantly complained about the main six click and how it was terrible that the show had a main cast and needed to focus more on the world. Firebrand actually spent an entire review of an episode about systemic racism trying to theorycraft the biology of the changelings. This is what the viewer base wants from the show. I don't expect my complaining to reach their ears. They're too deafened by pride and easy praise from dipshits to listen. What I'm hoping is that more viewers will learn what's going on and be less likely to be taken in by lazy, bland, soul world building the next time a series decides it doesn't want to put in any effort anymore. I don't begrudge the writers for taking the easy way out, collecting their paycheck, and going home, but I do begrudge them getting pissy that precisely one person in their massive pool of viewers spotted exactly what they were doing. <laughs>